Uh, hi, everyone. So that's me. Uh, I work for Lars and uh, gave some talks recently. We talked about dirty secrets of pen testing at DerbyCon, uh, capability-driven pen tests, and I beat up on Oracle for a while so much that I'm bored of it, so I know you guys are bored of it. Uh, Client-side stuff, open source information gathering stuff. So we're going to talk about um, why we're here is to talk about an over-reliance on vulnerability scanners and commercial pen test frameworks. So a lot of times we throw a range into the bone scanner, we import that into Metasploit Pro or Core Impact or whatever, and if it comes back with nothing, we're like, oh, good, client's good to go. Um, so much that a lot of times people are like, if it doesn't say exploitable, then we just don't try, we just carry on with our, with our day. Um, and I've found in my experience that clients can fail to remediate a lot of those low and medium things. And so reasons, I mean, I'm kind of open to suggestions. What I've come up with is, you know, they don't have enough time to do it because if they've got 500 highs and 3,000 lows, I'm certainly going to take care of the highs first. And by the time I get done with the highs, the next month has come around and a new giant stack of vulnerability results has been placed on the desk. <clears throat> but I think it's more so that people have been trained and conditioned not to worry about lows and mediums. And so that's kind of what I'm going to go with. And so what I'm talking about is I think organizations should focus on uh, the million things out there that can get them owned and not a no day. Um, of course, that stuff exists. But when you have glaring vulnerabilities hanging out there that anybody can exploit, that's kind of the important stuff. So fix the, fix the low-hanging fruit. Um, you know, Generally, no IDS signatures exist for that low and medium stuff, or they've gotten to the point where they're conditioned and ignored. You know, oh yeah, I know that web dev's enabled, I need it. So uh, they just ignore a lot of that stuff. So bottom line, don't rely on bone scanners to tell you everything that's owned, that's ownable. Uh, pen testers need to investigate your lows and mediums as thoroughly as they do the highs. And in turn, your clients need to go ahead and, and do that as well. And then, you know, keep a human in the mix. So I'm a firm believer that passwords suck. And I think we're going to show that one of these almost always works. Anybody ever, does everybody see those on like every single pen test? One of the, it's always company one, two, three? Yeah? No? A couple people? All right. One of those always works for me. Yeah, yeah, I mean, there's up case, low case. But so remembering that passwords suck, VNC with a password of no password gets you a high, where a VNC with a password of password gets you a low. Right, and so that carries on to the same thing for SSH, Telnet, all your databases. So default creds, unless you've configured your scanner to actually check for those default creds, don't. And therefore, so you get database open access or you know the service is listening, but it's not really a, a weakly protected service. Anybody tweak their Volan scanners to actually check for common passwords? Nobody, not even Dale. All right. And so, so the first kind of thing we'll talk about is admin interfaces. Uh, Chris Nickerson is the ninja at taking an admin interface and breaking into it on me. Um, so now I, after starting and working with him, I've got a methodology to find that stuff because it's always a race to find it before he does. And so a possible methodology for that is to in-map your range, take those results, put them into Metasploit because it does a database. When inside of Metasploit, you can actually pull out all the services into like a, a, a CSV. And then you can use uh, some Ruby to make an HTML file and Linky, which is a Firefox plugin. So that's in-map services. Uh, you can go through, and once you import everything, you can like, actually search for ports. So if you just want to see 8443 or just want to see 22 or just want to see whatever, you can do that. Uh, you can just do up ports. You can do all kinds of options to actually output that stuff. So it kind of looks like that. So uh, the poor range that my, blog, uh, that my website lives on gets scanned all the time. But, you know, so there's a whole bunch of hosts, there's a whole bunch of services listening. We can take some Ruby to actually take uh, the CSV file that gets outputted. You know, so if it's 443 or 8443, I know it's an HTTPS link. And so I just shove that port and IP and port in there. If it's 80, 80, 80, I'm pretty confident that it's going to be HTTP. And so I'll go ahead and do that. And if it's, one of the, if it's anything else, I'll go ahead and give me an HTTP link and an HTTPS link. And so then when you do that, you get, well, you use Linky. When you do that, you get a kind of a HTML file that looks like that. And then there's a, a pretty nifty Firefox plugin called Linky, which allows you to 
open all the links in a tab. And so now I can open all that stuff, and now all these magic interfaces start popping out for me. Useful? No? Go to hell? All right, cool. <laughs> okay, all right, Lord. So moving on. Cold Fusion. Who's got Cold Fusion in the enterprise? Nobody. All right, next slide. All right, well, uh, Cold Fusion is awesome for me, not so much for everybody else. So Cold Fusion typically gives you a risk factor of none, and it's low. Um, there's a lot. I stole this from Barricode's talk. Um, so when last time I searched, there was 455 million sites using Cold Fusion. So I'm surprised that there's not a single person here that uses it. You're all lucky. Um, so what's the problem with it? So cross-site scripting is abundant. Uh, SQL injection is pretty common because people fail to do uh, the, the proper parameterized queries. Lots of info disclosure, path disclosure, verbose error messages, just misconfigurations, which not, aren't necessarily you know, taking you to pwn, but is certainly you know, useful for the report. But more to this talk is two, two bugs that came out in the last couple years. You have the locale traversal, directory traversal exploit, and then the external entity and XML injection exploit. Uh, those are the two CVEs for those. And so almost every time I come across a cold fusion box, it's vulnerable to one of those things. <clears throat> so that's kind of what it looks like with the locale traversal. You basically directory traversal back, you pull the uh, password file for cold fusion, and then if you check out the GNU Citizen link, there's a whole thing on converting that to SHA-1, and you can basically just pass the hash and log into the admin interface with that. From there, you can set up scheduled jobs and things to run code or upload a shell or do whatever you want. Um, inside of this one is the entity injection. So up at the top right uh, is the path that you want to pull. And so this is just kind of saying you can do the same thing of pulling the uh, password hash via the XML injection vulnerability. And so it's right there. But uh, the XML injection vulnerability is kind of pimp because it will actually do directory listings for you. And so this guy actually had a cold fusion patches folder, but it wasn't really doing anything with it. So I thought that was kind of funny. And tripwire and some other things. But so. so also useful is now you can do directory listing. So if you're having a hard time finding the files that you're looking for, because for some reason it's not in you know, C, cold fusion 8 lib, password.properties, you can actually start looking for it if it's vulnerable to the XML injection bug. Useful? Cool. So that's my problem. Tomcat server, so server status. Anybody come across this on pen tests? Yeah, this one's kind of fun. You know, we all know that the unauth, uh, you know, deployer web console deployer thing is cool. You know, there's a there's an auto hack thing in Metasploit for that, and I don't unfortunately don't come across that too often, at least externally. But when you have server status and you give that full equals true, you get all sorts of things like all the published applications that are on JBoss and Tomcat. Uh, URLs that were recently accessed to include session IDs. So a lot of times you can just take that string that's right there and just shove that right in your browser and you're logged in, um, which is handy. Um, then you can find all the hidden apps. So I don't necessarily have to totally interrogate the app. The app will actually uh, tell me that stuff for me. So in this case, all the applications that are on that server on the, I think that's JBoss, are published for me. So I know all the URLs to go to. I know the slash, you know, slash ipegasus. I know that JMX console is deployed at least. Um, so it helps me. And then you have all sorts of, you know, this is all the Git requests that the thing's making. So had any of those been, you know, post or, you know, authenticated requests, I can just pull those in. Same thing for Tomcat. They're basically share the same bones where I can see versions and applications that are deployed and whatnot. So you can also use it to find pwn stuff. And so I was kind of doing some doing the pictures for this slide and was like, oh, that's neat. What is the E command? That's weird. So I was like, okay, let me browse to that. And so thankfully directory listings was turned on. I'm like, okay, that's weird. Oh, who am I? That's not good. And so you know that that had actually been on there for quite a while. You know, most of the stuff from that box was from 2007. So it's useful to find old, find pwn stuff while you're doing other stuff. All right. So, uh, browsable directories. So index of can be your friend. Same thing with web mirroring. So if web mirroring is enabled, you can just suck down the whole website, which 
usually includes useful stuff. Um, you know, but a lot of time, anybody use this one a lot? Like this one's totally a low. Yeah, and like we've, we've completely owned people because index of was on. So you can do cool stuff like find, you know, all the Ruby, all the web configs and everything, which is always handy. Um, web.config, so this one's got a web.config that was there, which had passwords in it. All right. Config.inc, right, which also had database passwords in it. This is about two seconds of like working on the web on that. And so this is one, hopefully I sanitized it enough. So we were actually kind of stuck on this pen test, and I was like, man, how am I, somebody's got, someone had already broken in, we knew they'd broken in, I'm like, how are these guys getting in? And so I found this, and so the top DBSQL one was a database backup. And so to their, to their credit, they were encrypting all the database passwords, which they should. Um, but unfortunately, live.tar was a backup of the site, and so that had the actual PHP running the site, which had the decrypt me function in it. And so I was able to take, you know, three lines of PHP to just decrypt all the, you know, credit card columns that we'd had. So I, I, that was a good win. I like that. And they also had other issues because directory uh, listing was turned on of all their logs were there, which had the encrypted data, but, you know, these guys had all, all that stuff. So that was fun. So I got that one. That one got a big success. Yes. All right. I think I earned my paycheck that day. All right, so... We're zooming. We're doing good, huh? All right. SharePoint. How many of you guys got SharePoint in the enterprise? All right, a couple people using SharePoint. I stole this slide from the minded security guy because it was neat, and I couldn't come up with anything as pretty. Um, but we see it a lot. A lot of places use it. Uh, a lot of places misconfigure it. And so it's useful for using uh, user and domain em enumeration, and a lot of times we'll see you know, the all, all documents shared out, um, which is usually a misconfiguration for most places. Um, if you've got auth SharePoint, it's always useful because there's always uh, router configs or alarm codes or something, you know, and that's, ask Chris about that if you want to talk about all that stuff. He's, he's also the ninja at finding all that stuff. And so <clears throat> generally that whole, like, low... Microsoft SharePoint is in the low category, and I have to remember to find that and interrogate that is down at the bottom of that list when you do your Nessus stuff. But um, it's, got some, it's got some good stuff you can find. So finding it, it's plentiful out in the web. You can use Google Dorks. The Stack and Lou guys have like 100 Google Dorks to find uh, various SharePoint things. So more so if you're actually looking at a particular client instead of trying to find somebody just randomly. Uh, they have the SharePoint Hacking Diggity Project, which is a bunch of URLs and a Perl script that's been converted to an EXE to run through and just check all the URLs against the IP you pass it. Or you can roll your own. There's a fuzz list, and then you can take Metasploit and write a quick auxiliary module to open that list and rip through the IP list, and then you find useful stuff. I just have like a little mini Nikto thing that I run. And so open access kind of looks like that where you've just got all the files and groups and lists and things just kind of hanging out there. Useful? Not useful? Okay, useful, awesome. Uh, username, so if it's, this is a, a pretty significant misconfiguration, but if they have misconfigured it, you can actually, you know, you see your ID equals 72, you can just use burp and just rip through, you know, one to what, a thousand or however big you think the organization is. And now you've got, Email, name, uh, you know, the top line is definitely, you know, Active Directory creds and what you need to pass to log in somewhere. Um, uh, let's see what else. It's another example, just, you know, pulling out domains, pulling out the admin. All right. You can also abuse uh, SOAP calls. So you need to have authentication for this, which is, you know, arguably hard to come by. You, you know, I don't know. But you can pass a simple post SOAP request to that. This is basically the cookie you need. So you can use burp to set up uh, auth, so it auths every time for you. And basically, you can say, hey, I want to get all the A's. So I want to get all the A's for the organization, limit my results to 1,000, and then the result of that is all the A's in Active Directory up to 1,000. And then you can obviously you just a, B, C, D, and then pretty soon you have a giant XML file full of all the users in the enterprise. 
So that's SharePoint 2010. Uh, this one works on SharePoint 2007 and below. Uh, basically the same thing. You're doing a SOAP request, and the result is a giant list of users and things back. Um, useful. And so once I have that list of users, I go back to password suck, and I go through and try my you know, 15, 20 passwords that I use every time, and I'm generally going to get one of those. Make sense? Useful? Cool. Let's see. So, how many guys run across uh, WebDAV or Search or HTTP puts on pen tests? When was the last time someone had an HTTP put work? All right, I've seen it once in my life. WebDAV, I've actually owned quite a bit of things with. So, um, typically, WebDAV comes back as uh, a low. Um, it's enabled by default on IS5, so every time I see it, I get really, really excited, and then I'm like, oh, crap, it's IS5, which means it's just enabled, and they probably didn't mean to enable it. Um, the game of you know, doing WebDAV is that it's almost never writable at the web root. You have to actually find, if it is enabled, the writable folder. So you know, taking Deerbuster and some Ruby to like, go ahead and find valid folders and then go back around and try those with you know, your web, web dev script of choice um, is kind of the methodology for going after that stuff. Anybody, how many people have owned stuff with writable web dev? Couple, yeah. I mean, it's, it's common enough that I have to make sure that I remember to check for it every test, but I don't obviously get into it every test. And so that's kind of like, uh, this is DAV test put out by the Scenario guys. And basically this, you give it the path, and it starts trying to put various file types and extension types. There's a, there's a Metasploit module written by Ryan Lin that does uh, something similar. Um, then he goes, okay, what can I put? Cool, you know, all these succeeded. Uh, let me go ahead and see now if the app goes ahead and allows me to exec those files, because a lot of times you can write a text file, but that's not ex executable. I obviously want to exec something that's executable, PHP, JSP, ASP, something like that. Um, and then you're know, sending backdoor shells and doing your thing. Also pretty useful. So the HTTP put and HTTP search stuff usually gets shoved into the uh, allowed methods, and you've kind of got to go through one by one and see if anything's useful. And search like put is a lot of times in is enabled in the options, but not necessarily enabled in IIS or, I think it's an IIS only thing, so not necessarily enabled in IIS and working, but you know, web scanners are better about finding puts, but they don't really test, because you have the same problem of finding that magic folder that you can actually put to. Um, search can be fun if it's enabled, because you get a directory listing of everything, and my, my buddy Rob Fuller did a blog post on that. You can check it out later, but it looks something like that is, you send uh, a valid XML or valid post request to the box, and then you get a list of everything in the web route. So that's pretty handy. Um, useful? Going to use it later on the pen test? Did anybody search for that and use that? No. Awesome. All right. So you guys got something out of the talk. All right. So that's my problem. I, love, I, I waste so much time on that site, it's not even funny. Yeah, it's bad. I just gave away my secret back there to my business partner. So, who's heard of this and uses this? How many of you guys got Macs? I know at least one of you better raise your hand because I'm looking at you and I know you have one. All right, so th this is enabled a lot, I think by default. Someone might cor correct me. I see it a lot on internals. Um, so it gets a low, you know, when you're scanning stuff. Oh, it's low, you got file shares. So what can you do with it? It's kind of like NFS and SMB. Uh, you can't use it to exploit stuff and run stuff, but you have read, read access to files and folders for sure. And then sometimes, depending on how they set it up, you've got write access. Um, finding it is, InMap uh, has a ton of scripts for looking for that stuff. Kind of looks like that. So you can do server info, and it tells you, uh, you know, server name and you know who the server is. And I think the next one has. Uh, so here's all the, the the folders that are actually shared out. So desktop, downloading, um, other stuff, Dropbox. That's handy. 
So if you got a Mac, it's like super easy to connect to this stuff. You basically just like connect to that and it will do it for you. I don't have a Mac because I'm poor. Uh, so and this guy, you know, he had his Gossip Girl season four. You know, that's some useful stuff. We'll keep keep you uh, Katy Perry. I don't know, nothing overly sexy there, but you know, you get the idea that you there's a potential for finding something useful to conti continue on with your pen test with with this uh, method. Um, I don't know. You know, I caught up on my Gossip Girl after that pen test. Uh, if you got Linux, uh, I couldn't find a Windows Windows utility to do it, but Linux, you've got AFPS NG, uh, which allows you basically you just install the stuff, and then you can just connect to the you know the remote host, um, much like NFS. Everyone's pretty familiar with NFS and Open NFS shares. Uh, that was in the slides, and then I took all that stuff out. I figured most people have heard of that. It's been around since before I was born. And so in Linux, Linux Lane, it kind of looks something like that. So auth, no user, authent. So um, pretty sure the if, in, if Nmap can give you some results of things, it's, it's authing without a username and password. So that's how you'll know you, can, you don't need auth to, to access this stuff. So basically, we're off into uh, Nasser's box in Iran and uh, checking out all his downloading and desktop stuff. Handy? Yeah, OK. So again, you, know, you can download Katie's Perry's stuff if you're on Linux. And check out Dropbox and other pictures and stuff. I was all excited because Nita Net sounded like something useful, and it wasn't. It was like pictures of flowers and butterflies, and I was pretty disappointed. All right. How about this? Who looks for this? Trace AXD. One guy. Awesome. This one's pretty money. Um, there's a lot of words up there. It basically is a debug function for ASP, and so it just logs everything you do. If you don't want to read all that, because it's a lot, I apologize. So uh, Nexpose will tell you that it's a, uh, a severe equals medium in Nexpose land. Um, Nessus land, it's a medium down there at the bottom. Um, and Acunetics says it's a medium as well. So I think we're sure it's a medium. So what can you do with it? Uh, you can read all the variables and data from HTTP requests. It, you know, it's configurable of how many it stores at the bottom there. Post requests are awesome. Uh, and then finding it, Vuln scanners are pretty good at finding that, and Metasploit has a module for it. So the Metasploit module looks kind of like that. Just give it a path. You know, how you're going to know it's KM4ZY, I don't know how you would find that. But the first one you might be able to find, that's the, you know, website path and trace AXT. Um, that's kind of what it looks like. So when you hit it, you've got, uh, you know, the last 10 requests. And then when you can click on the uh, view details thing to see what was going on with it. All right, useful. Yeah, I thought so. Uh, let's see, I think we zoom in on the next slide. So this one actually had creds to the app in the post request. So useful. <laughs> All right. Citrix. How many of you guys got Citrix? A lot of Citrix. All right, so kind of looks like that. You log in get access to some apps. Uh, Citrix gets a low in Nessus for, hey, it's there, it's secure. So it looks like that, you know, if you've if you got money to spend, you've got multi-factor auth on it, and then you can log into uh, the website or the Citrix. There's a couple of Citrix type E clients, or, you know, usually you just log in and play Solitaire all day. Uh, that's what, it is. that's the good stuff. Might be harder to break out of Solitaire than some of the other apps that they actually deploy. Might be a recommendation for later. So what you can do with it, um, lots of access to published applications, um, escaping from those public, published applications, which is always fun, um, and like lots of discovery. So let's go through how to find some of that stuff. So again, Nmap has some really fun scripts for identifying uh, and so enumerate. So this one shows enumerating servers XML, and so you throw it at an IP. 
and it shows uh, the various uh, Citrix servers that support that IP. So this place had f actually five of them kind of supporting load balance in a, like a load balance thing. Um, Citrix Enum Apps actually pulls out all the published applications if the box is misconfigured. And so this one was pretty handy because I got a whole bunch of like usernames. Right, useful, like J.R. J. R. M. Myers, like that's useful. I now have like well, half of what I need to log into the app. Useful? Anybody knew that was there? Anybody know that was there? Yeah, like that's, that's the, uh, yeah, you got to use that. And so the talk I gave with Rob uh, Fuller at DerbyCon, we talked about in-map scripts. And uh, I'd really highly recommend making use of those and bringing those into your pen testing methodology because the best ones like this don't actually fire off when it sees, you know, 443 open. You have to tell it to go after, to look for Citrix stuff. Um, lots of useful stuff there. So when you take a bunch of usernames and then you remember that password suck, you've probably got a pretty good chance of getting into one of those. Um, also works over 1604 UDP. So in this case, it enumerated all these random. I don't speak Spanish, so that pro if anybody speaks Spanish, it probably means something. But um, you get a whole bunch of other apps. So same thing on the UDP side. And this is typically you'll see this more on the older Citrix environments. Um, again, enumerate the Citrix server. Anybody come across ICA files? A bit. Anybody deploying those, and that's how users get into your enterprise? One, okay. Those are pretty useful because you know they're basically text files, and once they're associated with a Citrix client, you can change the properties inside of those text files to to do stuff. So, you know, once you log in, you click it, and it looks something like that. But you can also take all the different uh, apps that you enumerated and start changing your ICA file to actually start connecting to those. So. You know, it's one of those gives you that. You know, changing the ICA file gives you that, right? Useful, because you might find some app that's not auth protected or not a grocery cart. Man, I had zoomed through my slides. And then, I think there's been a lot of talks and research on escaping from those applications. So, once you're actually logged into those applications, it's pretty trivial to get out of them. Uh, I did a couple blog posts on it. Uh, that's been that stuff's kind of been talked about quite a bit. So, getting command shells, getting explorer.exe, and then you know navigating around, getting the network neighborhood, and seeing what you can see from the Citrix server, and doing other things. All right, and then iCat is super awesome for that. Anybody use that? Yeah, it's the bomb for if you're doing any sort of kiosk stuff, and someone's giving you creds to some like little kiosk, it will. It will say, hey, oh, I'm a Linux, I'm Linux, I'm Windows, and we'll start trying all the various Linux and Windows tricks to, to escape out of that. It's all automagic, which is cool. So that's the problem. So, and I zoomed through slides. So to recap, don't rely on your vulnerability scanners to find all your important stuff. Um, you guys, and how many pen testers do we have? Couple? All right, yeah. You guys got to make sure that we also focus on, we collectively, because I forget to do it too, uh, focus on those lows and mediums and validate that they're not, uh, you're not missing something good with that's hitting in a low and medium. Clients need to do it and keep it human. So uh, that's all I got. I guess I'm open to questions. That was easy. You sure? Yes, Dale. I forgot. Oh. So, in general, over all the stuff you discussed, but mainly the Citrix stuff at the end, how noisy are some of those scans when you try to, you know, enumerate some of that data? Uh, so, for the XML one, that's a, a one post request. Um, I think the hardest part of that one is actually parsing the XML that comes back, because when you get a gl giant glob of XML like from uh, from that. Let's see. That's a lot of info that came back, but that's a single post request. That's all the app is doing. Uh, and I th it's a similar query uh, for the UDP side of the house too. So I don't think very noisy. 
any IDS analysts could let me could correct me, please, because I'd like to know if it's like sending off like the fire brigade after me when I do that. Um, I think we've seen it a lot, and I haven't ever. No one's ever seen us doing it. Anything else? Okay. Uh, I'll, I'll add why he's bringing that. I don't, know if, I don't remember if I put it at the beginning. Like, I don't necessarily think these vulnerabilities are mislabeled. I think, for the most part, they're correctly labeled as lows and mediums. Um, I think it's just important to realize that you can abuse those in certain situations. So I just want to make sure I add that. Yep. Quick question. Um, would it make sense to try to brute force uh, application IDs uh, to find non-published ones or...? Um, I th or I try to at least uh, somehow discover them not by brute forcing, but kind of brute force, but... Uh, uh, okay, so to my knowledge, um, it has to be p allowed to be queryable. If it's allowed to be queryable, then it will just give you that information. And so if it wasn't, I don't think you could actually enumerate that. But someone can correct me if I'm wrong. Did that make sense? Like, they have to enable the discovery of that stuff. And if they've enabled it, you could, like, password guess against it or uh, application guess against it. But I think if they've enabled it, then it would just be turned on and would just give you that information if you asked for it, if you just gave it the right request. I think there was one on the front, too. Or did I answer it? He's coming. I appreciate y'all asking questions so I didn't end, like, super, super early. Um, can you go back to the last SharePoint slide? Yeah. Um, I think in one slide you mentioned that you need to be authorized for the enumeration. And uh, these two? This, yeah, here you see the cookie. In the next slide, yep. you don't see the cookie. Does that mean you, you don't have to be authorized? No, you need auth. Um, you need auth for that, for that yeah, one too. Yeah. Um, so I did that in Burp, and Burp's kind of like handling that. Like, so in the Burp tab, you can say do auth for me, and it's kind of magically doing that. And okay. I think uh, the cookie that comes back is, at least on this app that we were testing, uh, the, the cookie was in the uh, view state, right? And it would, the, cookie at the, the cookie value at the top said like authenticated and gave like a 60-minute window or something. Um, and that was in the response. So, so yes, it does require authentication. Awesome. Okay. Um, yeah, I couldn't. I think all the soap calls uh, require auth, to my knowledge, for that kind of stuff. Okay. Thanks. So, it's, so that's good. I mean, that's that's correct behavior, right? So now you're just on, you know, did you know HR HR get me into the app or not? All right. Anything else? Well, thanks for coming. That's all I got.